Hi there guys, Mr. Eck here. Today we're going to talk about solving a linear programming problem without graphing. Linear programming problems are problems like the problem cookies in Math 2. They're problems that involve constraints, they involve profit. You usually are trying to work with constraints to find the best combination of items that will maximize your profit or maximize your points or minimize your costs. Uh, and there's many steps to doing these problems. When we've done them before, here's the steps that we've done. Uh, step one, we've always defined our variables, constraints, and written the objective function. And then after that, we would graph all the constraints. We'd look at that graph to find what we call the feasible region. Uh, we would find the coordinates of every corner point of that feasible region. And this is where there was usually a lot of work with algebra and systems. And then we would check all the corner points, evaluate them in the objective function, the profit function, to figure out which one uh, was the best choice. Our new approach is something that's going to work whether or not we can have a graph. Um, it's a really powerful approach because it does work when you can't draw a graph. Um, and that's what we're going to be working towards. So in the new approach, first step is the same. You still write out all your variables. You write out your objective function, all of that. But after that, the next thing you do, or next thing we're going to do, is instead of making a graph, we're just going to list every possible corner point. Uh, and it's going to be kind of a long list. So we're just going to put them all out there on the page. Um, and then once we listed all of them, we're going to find their coordinates. And, and again, it, it's a long list. It kind of takes a while. But we still haven't made a graph. And then the third thing we're going to do is uh, check which of these constraints fit, uh, or which of the possible corner points fit every constraint, and we're going to cross out the ones that don't fit. So it's sort of like a backwards approach here. Instead of graphing first and using our eyes to see which are the, the working corner points, we're going to find all the corner points and then check which ones work. So I've borrowed some constraints from page 173 in the book. Uh, this, these are constraints that don't have a word problem attached, so we're just going to pretend we've already done step one. We read the problem, it, we found some kind of story, and from that story we wrote these five constraints using the variables x and y. Um, using the old method, what we would do at this time is take those constraints and draw the graph. I've done this using the computer already, uh, just to show you what it will look like. And I've labeled the constraints with letters, and I've labeled the lines uh, with the matching constraints. So if we were doing this the old way, the next step would be to take a look at every single one of these and sort of like shade to the left or right. We'd shade this one and we'd shade this one. But we'd have to look at the equations to figure out like which direction should be shaded. So without looking at the equations, I don't actually know like if this is the feasible region or maybe this is the feasible region or maybe this is the feasible region up here. Like, it sort of depends on the way the constraints are written. And so we'd have to do all this stuff with graphing inequalities, and it would be kind of annoying. Um, when we do this method of no graphing solutions, we don't have to do this. So let's get rid of all this. Instead, what we're going to do is look for all of the possible corner points. So I'm looking at the graph, and what I see is that, like, whatever my feasible region ends up being, it's going to have some corners. And a corner is defined by an intersection of two lines. So for example, this is a possible corner. And I'm going to call this possible corner CB, because it's the intersection of constraint C and the intersection of constraint B. So every single one of these possible corners, I'm going to put a, a dot at every possible corner. Boop, 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 boop. So it looks like there are nine possible corner points. Uh, this one, for example, was co possible corner point A, B, because it's the intersection of constraint A and constraint B. And so every single possible corner point has sort of a two-letter, because it's made of uh, two constraints, a two-letter code. Um, let's go for this method of not graphing. So the first step of your method of, of uh, doing this without making a graph, I've taken the graph and put it over on the side, is to just list all the possible corner points. Since there's two variables, our corner points are any combination of two letters. 
So the first possible corner point on my list will be the intersection of constraint A and constraint B. That's the first one. The second on my list will be the intersection of constraint A and constraint C. Then of constraint A and constraint D. Then of constraint A and constraint E. So just by sort of systematically, alphabetically making this list, I'm going to get every possible corner point that there could ever possibly be on the graph. Uh, so I've run out of A, so now I'm going to do B. B can't be friends with B. I've also already got BA up here, so when I start with B, I can go straight to BC. So it sort of feels like it's going to take a really long time, and then uh, it speeds up as you go. So we got BC, BD, BE, and then I'm out of things to go with B, so I go C, D, C, E, and then uh, I'm out of things that go with C, so I go D, E, and by the time I'm done with D, I'm also done with E, because I've got all the constraint E's already built in up here. So I've got my list of possible corner points. Now if I count them, I notice there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 possible corner points. Um, you might be wondering, what the heck is happening over here? Why did I only see 9 on the graph, but I had 10 on my list? Here's why. Um, a corner point happens when two lines meet, but there are two lines in this picture that are parallel that don't meet, line C and line E. And so uh, CE did not appear on the graph. When we go back to solving, uh, we'll look at what happens with the equations that make it clear that CE doesn't actually work, uh, doesn't appear on the graph. But like when we're listing it, we don't have to worry about that. We just put it on the list and we'll deal with it next time. All right, so what I'm gonna do on this page right now uh, is find the coordinates of every possible corner point. And so I'm gonna keep my chart over here on the left side and do all my work over here on the right side. So for possible corner point A, B, here's my list for work. For possible corner point A, B, uh, I'm gonna solve the equation x plus two y equals eight, and 2x plus y equals 13. Uh, this feels like I can solve it by elimination. So I think I will multiply this guy by negative 2 and rewrite it down here. So I get negative 2x minus 4y equals negative 16. And then I'll add the equations down. So I get 0 minus 3y equals negative 3, so y would equal 1, and then x plus 2 times 1 would have to equal 8, so x would have to equal 6. So I know the coordinates of corner point, possible corner point a, b are 6, 1, and I come over here on this side, and I write it right there. So I, I'm just doing a lot of work throughout, uh, and then recording my answer over here. Then I do the next one, possible corner point A, C. Uh, so corner point A has the equation x plus 2y equals 8. Corner point C has the equation y equals 3. Notice that when I jump between uh, the inequalities and solving for the corners, I replace all of the inequalities with equal signs. That's because I'm not looking for where shaded regions intersect. That's because I'm looking for specifically where two lines intersect. So uh, I'm looking for the intersection of two lines, like a point where they meet, and so I make them equals. So with that in mind, uh, let's keep solving. So this says if y is 3, then x plus 2 times 3 equals 8, and x would have to equal 2. So I'm going to go through the point 2, 3. So notice that it feels like a lot of work, but many of them are going to be fast to solve. Anything with a zero constraint is going to be really fast to solve. Um, but I'm going to show the work anyway, just to, you know, in the spirit of being thorough here. So I've done AC. So now I do the work for AD. x plus 2y equals 8 x equals 0, so if x is 0, then 2y would equal 8, and y would equal 4. So this is going to go through the point 0, 4. Uh, 
work for AE. X plus 2Y equals 8 and Y equals 0. Well, if Y is 0 in this equation, then X would have to equal 8. So this is going to go through the point. So this is going to go through the point uh, 0, uh, 8, 0. Sorry. Okay, now constraint A is done. Let's look at constraint uh, B. So work for constraint B. Uh, 2x plus y equals 13, and I'm going to do bc. So constraint c says y equals 3. So then uh, if you substitute that in, I say 2x must equal 10, and x must equal 5. So I'm going to have the point 5, 3. So this goes really fast. Uh, bc. B, D. I don't know why I have this out of order here. I'll change that. Um, for constraint B, D, uh, I know 2x plus y would equal 13. This is saying x equals 0, which if that's true, then y would have to equal 13. So this is the point 0, 13. All right, so uh, then we're going to move back to point B, E. So looking at constraint B and E. So here I'm solving the equation 2x equals 13. So x would have to equal uh, 6.5. So I'm going to go through the point 6.5 comma 0. All right, I'm done with constraint B. Now uh, I can go on to constraint C, C, D. Now life starts to get a little easy. First constraint C says y equals 3. Second constraint D says x equals 0. So what point must this go through? Must go through 0, 3. So all the hard part was done at the top of the list. The back, uh, end of the list is much easier. Constraint C, E. Remember, this is the one we highlighted if we noticed those lines were parallel. So let's look at what happens here when I try to solve this. I go write C, I say Y equals 3, and I write uh, E. I write constraint E, sorry, that says Y equals 0. This can't be true. Right? There's nothing that makes both of these things true. Um, there's no intersection point for these lines. So there is no corner point here. So what I'm, in the list, I'll just write something like, I'll write the empty set symbol, or I can write NS. Um, but I know from here on out, I don't have to worry about CE. CE can be crossed off the list. Um, but I do have to include uh, E and D, or DE, on the list. Uh, and that is uh, going to be x equals 0 and y equals 0 giving me the point 0, comma 0. Hold on a second. So at this point, we've made an exhaustive list of all the possible corner points. I've saved my work over on the other side, so if I need uh, to go back and look at it for anything, I find a mistake, I've got it. Uh, but now I've made my list. Now we have to do this sort of weird thing where I have to check um, each corner point. So there, these are possible corner points, but they're only going to be real corner points if they satisfy every constraint. So for example, point 0.61, it must satisfy constraint A and B, but it also has to satisfy constraint C, constraint D, and constraint E. So since I know this works in A and B, 6 and 1, uh, I need to check against all these other things. So I look first, is 1 less than 3? Yes. Is 6 greater than 0? Yes. Is 1 greater than 0? Yes. So this checks out. So I just say, uh, I just put a check mark. I say it's okay. Don't just put check marks here. You have to actually assess whether these work. So this is not saying like check your work. This is saying confirm that this is a real corner point. Uh, a and C, 2 comma 3. So I'm going to look at it and say, uh, all right, I know it's going to work in A, and I know it's going to work in C because that's where it came from. 
but I need to check in B. So is 2 times 2 plus 3 less than 13? Well, that would be 4 plus 3, which is 7. So since 7 is less than 13, that's okay. They're both greater than 0, greater than 0, greater than 0. So this one's fine. Now, now we're going to get interesting. I look at AD. I got the combination 0, 4. Um, so I know it works in A. I know it's going to work in D. I know this is bigger than 0, so that's fine. Um, 2 times 0 plus 4 is less than 13. That's all right. But wait. 4 is not less than 3. So I'm checking this point, and I notice that it breaks constraint C. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of cross it off the list, and I'm going to write over here uh, that it broke constraint C. So we can do like C and cross it off. If you're feeling lazy, you can write it breaks C. Um, there's a number of ways you can write it. You should keep track of which constraint it breaks just for like reference. So that way, if you're working with your group and the person across the table challenges you and says, no, I think this satisfies all the constraints, you can say, no, my friend, I believe you're wrong. I believe it breaks constraint C. So it's just sort of keeping track of everything. Let's keep going. Uh, AE, we got eight and zero. So it's going to work in A. That makes sense. It's going to work in E. That makes sense. Um, but what about here when I plug in? 2 times 8 plus 0 equals 13. Oh, no, 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 because 2 times 8 would be 16. So this right away, I see this breaks constraint B. So I'm going to write like something like this. You're off the list. Uh, so now I keep checking. Uh, B, C, I know it's going to work in B and C. I have to check against A. So 5 plus 2 times 3 would be 6. Wait, 5 plus 6 is 11 which is not less than eight. So that one breaks A. Boom, you're off the list. And so we're starting to eliminate all of these corner points. We found them, but they're not true corner points. They were just possible ones, but they're fake. All right, B and D. So now I have to check this. Uh, ooh, I see if Y is 13, then two Y is 26. 26 is not less than eight. So that's gonna break constraint A. As soon as you find a constraint that breaks, cross it off, get that thing out of here. Um, BE, 6.5 comma 0. So I need to check in A. Well, let's see. 6.5 is less than 8. That's all right. Um, it's less than 3. It's greater than 0. It's greater than 0. Uh, I know it works in B and E because that's where it came from. So this guy's okay. He's fine. All right. My wife is laughing at me. Uh, CD over here, 0, 3. I got to check against everything again. So let's see. Uh, 0 plus 2 times 3 is 6 is less than 8. That's fine. Um, 2 times 0 plus 3 is less than 13. That's fine. Um, everything's greater than 0. This one's all right. C and D, 0 comma 3 is fine. C, E, we said there's already no solution, so I'm just going to cross it off, but we already did that work. And then 0, 0. Um, 0 is less than 8. 0 is less than 13, 0 is less than 3, 0 is more than 0, 0 is more than 0. So this one's fine. So I have found 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 that we are going to call uh, real corner points. So there are 5 real corner points uh, of the feasible region. Um, the last step in this whole process would be to evaluate those five real remaining corner points into the objective function. Now, on the page of page 173, the book doesn't give us an objective function, so we're going to make one up today. Uh, the objective function I'm going to make up is going to be an easy one. It's just going to be x plus y. Um, because I'm trying to, to, you know, make us efficient as possible. And let's say that we want to minimize x plus y. Um, for some reason in the story, it uh, doesn't really matter what the reason is, um, because there's not actually a story here. So what do I do x plus y? I do 6 plus 1 equals 7. 2 plus 3 equals 5. 
6.5 plus 0 equals 6.5. Uh, 0 plus 3 equals 3, and 0 plus 0 equals, well, 0. So notice I didn't have to plug in any of the ones that broke constraints into my objective function. Uh, you can, but it's not a good use of your time because they're not true corner points of the feasible region. So uh, since I said I was trying to minimize the objective function, I guess it's kind of a silly answer because 0 is definitely the smallest number here. So this uh, zero uh, combination of corner points would be the best in this particular objective function. Uh, if we go back to the graph and we take a look at the feasible region, it looks like the feasible region was probably this zone right here. Hi there. And so if we look at like which constraints actually worked in the graph, uh, we had combination A, B, that was there. We had combination A, C, that was there. We had combination uh, D, E. We had combination C, D. There's C, D. And we had combination uh, down here, E, B, or B, E. So these five corner points made sort of the actual feasible region. And we were able to find those without ever drawing a graph, without ever making shading, just by creating this sort of uh, algorithmic table here. So to close today, let's talk about a few of the advantages of this method. So some advantages of this method. First advantage, you don't have to make a graph. Um, I mean, I personally kind of like graphing, but I know not everyone does. You need your graph paper, you need your ruler, you need you know, your colored pencils. Like It can be a pain. Uh, thing two, this table method is going to work when, it, when you can't graph. Uh, right away, we're going to be moving to problems that have three or four variables. You could try to graph those in three dimensions or four dimensions, but you're going to have a hard time. It's a lot easier to just work with a table. Uh, advantage number three, it's super systematic. It's very algorithmic. You just kind of uh, get yourself into a headspace of crunching a bunch of numbers for a while. And you know what? It's kind of fun to get into that space and just crunch. Um, other advantages is like super thorough. You're just, by the end of making that table, you are dead sure that you've got the best answer because you found every possibility and ruled out the ones that don't work. Um, and then thing three, like another advantage of the systematic method is that if you were programming a computer to do this, which like in all honesty, if you do this in the professional world, you probably will be programming computers to do a lot of this work. Uh, it's a lot easier to program a computer to make a table than it is to program a computer to read a graph and decide, like look at a feasible region through shading. So in that sense, um, this is a, a more better method for a world of technology that we live in. Um, and then method three is if we're not doing it with a computer, uh, it's easy to sort of split the table up and divide the lines up um, across a group. If you're doing it with a graph, kind of everyone already has to have their own graph. So it's not quite as easy to split it up uh, and divide your labor. Uh, what are the disadvantages? Well, um, one is like there's no corner point, right? You can't actually say, hey, look at the corner point. Here it is. Um, so some people find that challenging. Uh, I find it a little annoying with this method that I do all that work to find some of those corner points and then I just cross them out. That's a little frustrating that I did work I crossed out. Um, and the corollary of that is it can be a little bit tedious uh, depending on you know how long the problem is. So there's advantages, there's disadvantages, but it is the method that you have to use once we have more than two variables. Um, and it's actually a pretty good method for two variable systems as well. Um, Finally, before I leave you today, I want to talk about one way to help out with this tediousness. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the example and change it up a little bit. Uh, so in the original one that we did above, uh, the constraint was y is less than 3. What if the constraint had said y greater than or equal to 3? Well, if it had said that, oh gosh, then we would have been looking at, a con at two constraints here that say the same thing. So, for example, uh, if y has to be bigger than or equal to 3, then automatically y is also bigger than or equal to 0. And so in this case, we could have taken constraint E and just crossed it right out. Why does that matter? 
Well, let's go and make that list of letter combinations now. I'd start, I'd do A, B, A, uh, C, A, D, uh, but then I, I've crossed out E, so I can go straight to B. I can do B, C, B, D, and I'm done with B. I go, I crossed out E, I can't do it. I go straight to C, I do C, D, and I'm done. So if it's possible to cross out one or more constraints, you can make your work a lot less. There are only six possible corner points here, rather than 10 that there were before, just because we were smart about crossing out a constraint. So that's something we're going to be trying to do a whole lot to make our workload less here. Um, and it's sort of an advanced strategy, but it's a really helpful one. So I think that's the last strategy I have for you today. Um, try all the problems in the book. Uh, if you try one and you find it really challenging, try another. Go back and try uh, heavy flying without graphing. Go back and try the skateboarder problem without graphing. Those are nice ones to go back and look at because you already know the answer. Um, and just like force yourself to do this method, even though it's a little annoying, even though it takes a while, because this is the way that we're going to be solving problems from here on out. And have a good day.